design crisis. I think that the built environment, as we've designed it, and as designed and constructed by, by my generation and those before, uses, you know this from your classes, far more energy and generates than far more greenhouse gases than our oceans and forests and soils can sequester, which is not new to you. Um, and we know that um, the same built environment depends on more fresh water than will shortly be available, and that we are in, is reflecting in our society uh, inequities in shelter access and social justice. These things. And to my mind, those are pretty great, but to my mind, these are failures of imagination or failures of design. And I ask myself every day when I'm teaching architecture, when I have time to think about that, <laughs> what will it take to make transformative change? And I think that there's three things. I was thinking about this as I was thinking about Virginia's work. Um, I think it would take great imagination, this ability to envision something totally, totally different. I think it will take great risk a willingness to pursue something that's unproven already. I think it will take great insight, an ability to be able to see through this fog to what's really important. Imagination, risk, and insight. So I want to, I'm inviting you now to look at the work of Rael San Fratello Architects in that context of those three things. And I hope that you're inspired as I am about the potential of their designs and their design imagination for envisioning and making a different kind of future. So in that context, I am uh, very pleased to introduce Virginia, to Virginia Sanfratello. Uh, Sanfratello's research revolves around the convergence of digital, ecological, and building component design and architecture. She was the recipient of Metropolis Magazine's Next Generation Design Award for her hydro wall concept, and with Ronald Royale, currently has a collection of recently designed masonry units which hold vegetation on display in New York. She's working with manufacturers and distributors to launch those components into the marketplace. Zanzatello is a licensed practicing architect with over 10 years of professional and academic experience. And prior to uh, joining the faculty at San, San Jose State University and then prior to that California College of the Arts, she was the co-director of Clemson University's Charles E. Daniel Center for Building Research and Urban Studies in, in uh, Italy. She has been a member of the design faculty at Southern California Institute of the Architecture in Los Angeles and a visiting professor, um, with, um, concurrent with my time there at the University of Arizona. Please join me in welcoming Virginia Santatello. Well, thank you very much, Erin. That was a very generous <laughs> introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. It's really an honor to be here today to talk to you and to share with you some of the recent ideas uh, that we have been exploring in our design studio. So I'd like to present some of the work, the recent work of Rail San Fratello Architects. We're involved in large-scale speculations, built works, the design and fabrication of building components, and have participated in several exhibitions over the last year. And I'd like to present a project or two from each of these categories that explores issues of technology and ecology in different ways. So what is technology? Technology is simply the way in which social groups provide themselves with the material objects of their civilization. It's the application of knowledge. And as a design studio, we're interested in technologies that are emerging in the digital realm. For example, our studio takes advantage of CAD CAM technologies. We're interested in how these technologies can inform the way, <coughs> or even change the way, we as designers construct and fabricate and manufacture buildings and their components. We're also interested in technologies that affect the way we live on a day-to-day -day basis, so how we receive water or electricity in our home. At the same time we're thinking about technology, we're also attempting to address issues of ecology. Our work often addresses environmental issues, the study of communities and the relationships that exist within them and between them and the physical world. So today I want to present five projects that look at technology in different ways. Uh, the first one is Border Wall as Architecture, which was um, a proposal that we made for the WPA 2.0 competition last year and was one of the six winters. Uh, it looks at emerging technology that relates to solar energy harvesting and um, water purification along the border. I'd like to show you Prada Marfa, which is another project we constructed along the border. And then three ideas we have about building components and the uh, manufacture of, of um, 
components and systems using rapid prototyping technology. So the hydro wall, the planter bricks, and digital cement. <coughs> and I'll start with the border wall as architecture. Um, the U.S. Secure Fence Act of 2006 funded the single largest and most expensive building project in the United States of the 21st century. It finances over 700 miles of fortification between the United States and Mexico at the average cost of $4 million per mile. <clears throat> in many locations, the existing fence is fabricated of steel, wire mesh, concrete, even repurposed Vietnam-era Air Force landing strips. Elsewhere, it makes use of high-tech surveillance systems, aerostat blimps, subterranean probes, and heat sensors. In all cases, the concept of national security governs and militates construction and design of the wall. And the success of the wall has been measured in the number of intercepted illegal crossings solely. So this project suggests that the wall, at such prices, should and could be thought of not only as security, but also as productive infrastructure, a coupling of the wall with viable infrastructure. And this proposal focuses on water, renewable energy, and urban social infrastructure as a pathway to security and safety in border communities and the nations beyond them. The border wall as architecture proposes a wide array of benefits and retrofits and new schemes for border wall infrastructure that build on existing conditions and that seek to ameliorate current problems. Now before I come to them, our proposals, I need to briefly address the current conditions and realities in which we're working. So over 700 miles of barriers have been constructed since 2006 at the cost of 3.4 billion dollars. Additionally, the new wall has been breached over 3,000 times and every time it's breached it has to be repaired and we've spent 4.4 million dollars repairing these 700 miles of walls. The construction and maintenance costs are estimated to exceed 49 billion dollars over the next 25 years and there are several hundred more miles of wall construction that have been recently proposed and are likely to be approved. So let us briefly put this kind of investment in context by comparing the cost estimated to complete and maintain the wall to other US projects. So what can you buy for $49 million? I'm sorry, $49 billion. Well, you can buy 300 Seattle public libraries for that. <laughs> Additionally, the number of deaths during attempted crossings is at its highest since 2006 and over 6,000 people uh, have died in the last 15 years. It might also be noted that 30 laws were waived or suspended for the construction of the wall, including important environmental, wildlife, and Native American heritage protections. Our counterproposals create a productive border through the site-specific but also modular solutions, retrofits, and new schemes. And I'll focus on three areas in today's presentation. The first is water infrastructure, the second is renewable energy, and the third is social infrastructure. So let's start with water security. The border wall has proven to be an effective, if accidental, water collection system. Water from desert rains typically drain across the border, as they should, yet in areas such as Nogales, Arizona, the fence acts instead like a dam. It not only prevents northern flows of immigrants, but funnels southerly water flows into nearby cities. If water collection were considered proactively along the border, it could be realized on a much larger scale with massive consequences for communities. For example, here you see an aerial view of the city of El Paso, or I should say the cities of El Paso and Juarez, with the Rio Grande River Basin running through <clears throat> the center, which of course divides the United States from Mexico. So the city of El Paso levies stormwater fees on all residents and businesses based on the amount of impervious surfaces on their property. This money is then used to pay for a proposed stormwater catchment basin system, which is intended to ameliorate the consequences of flooding um, in this rapidly growing desert city. And El Paso plans to raise $650 million for the entire project. 
which will distribute stormwater catchment basins throughout the city. And here in this drawing, we've taken the proposed stormwater catchment basins and lined them up for scale along the Rio Grande River, which, by the way, no longer runs through the cities of El Paso and Juarez. By locating these catchment basins along the river instead of throughout the city, a linear park in riparian ecology could once again flow through the two cities. Locating additional rainwater collection shed roofs along the existing wall increases the amount of water collected, but also creates cool, well-shaded places where performances, markets, and events could take place. If this resource is then water banked, this could lead to the eventual reopening of the river to the city. This has important security implications as well. The purpose of wall construction is not to stop the flow of immigrants from the south, but rather to slow it down. According to the Department of Homeland Security, the wall gives Border Patrol agents five additional minutes to apprehend an illegal crosser. And they say that rivers also offer this same five minutes of added time to the Border Patrol agent's advantage. So a linear water park and wall that meanders on both sides of the border can create a doubly secure linear tactical, social, ecological, and hydrological infrastructure. Now, water can be, water security rather, can be applied differently in another location. And here you see an aerial view of the New River, uh, which is the most polluted river in the United States. It flows north from Mexicali, Mexico, and crosses the border at Calexico, California. New River toxicity is comprised of chemical runoff from farm industry, sewage, contaminants such as volatile organic compounds, heavy metals, pesticides, pathogens like tuberculosis, hepatitis, and cholera, as well as fecal coliform bacteria, which at the border checkpoint far exceed the U.S.-Mexico treaty limits. The New River then flows through the Imperial Valley, California, which is a major source of winter fruits and vegetables, cotton and grain for the United States and the international market. While the Secure Fence Act of 2006 was enacted, according to President Bush, to help protect the American people from illegal immigration, drug smuggling, and terrorism, the New, Rep the New River represents a far more dangerous flow north from Mexico. So we would like to propose a wastewater treatment wall located in the two-mile-long wasteland that buffers the dense border city of Mexicalo from the agricultural Eden of the Imperial Valley. It would offer a solution to the illegal entry of toxins. The pollution problem is expected, in fact, to worsen as Mexicali's population, already at 1.3 million, continues to grow. And for $33 million, the same cost as the wall that divides Calexico and Mexicali, a treatment facility with the capacity to handle 20 million gallons a day of effluent from the New River could be constructed. This proposed facility, comprised of a linear pond filtration and purification system, would create a secure and valuable border. The positive byproduct of it would be clean water for irrigation and for gray water, as well as methane for energy, which could power the hungry cities of the Southwest. So I have more to say about water security and infrastructure as it can be coupled with other issues, especially solar power. But first, we should introduce another issue, and that's solar security. So the most untapped potential for solar development in the United States lies along the U.S.-Mexico border. Solar farms are very secure infrastructural installations. What if we were to reallocate some of the funds used simply to construct and maintain the border for the construction of energy infrastructure along the border? We could actually create scenarios in many instances that are more secure than the existing border and that simultaneously provide in energy. So consider here the 100-mile stretch of border between Nogales, Arizona and Douglas, Arizona. There, 87 miles of border wall have been constructed at a cost of $333.5 million. Compare that figure to the cost of the largest solar farm in the world, 
which is the Omedia Photovoltaic Park in Spain, which cost $530 million. For, thir for $333.5 million, 54 miles of profit-generating solar farm could have been constructed instead. That's enough to power 40,000 houses every year. Also, if we learn from countries like Germany, <clears throat> which are leading in the new energy economy, we'll discover that there, 5.3 gigawatts of solar farms have created 10,000 jobs. And not just temporary jobs, but permanent jobs. So solar plus water. <clears throat> so when solar energy is coupled with water collection, it also offers a key component for the establishment of life safety beacons across the border, where the principal cause of death among migrants attempting to cross the border illegally is dehydration. Solar-generated electricity could power beacons that inform border patrols <clears throat> of both immigrants or American citizens who find themselves in danger in the harsh extremes of the southern deserts. Engaging the water dispenser or even approaching the life safety beacon would alert border patrol. Such devices could also ameliorate the effects that access to water has on wildlife who find themselves unable to travel their natural routes in search of water. And lastly, social infrastructure. So while thus far most of our work has focused on public utility style resources, we would also like to stress the importance of social improvements along the border. Sports, for example. <clears throat> and I, I want to show you this, this video, which is kind of fun. So sports are inherently social activities. <clears throat> where networks of people with common interests are formed. The social cap capital produced by these networks is a core element in the fabric of communities. It produces safety and security friendship and community, civic identity, and economic value. Sports have served as a way to cope with the realities of the wall. And as such, the border wall can and should be envisioned as a linear park through certain urban geographies. So when supplemented with green spaces connected to schools and other parks, there's no reason not to think of the wall as the organizing element through these urban typographies, offering pedestrian and bicycle routes through the city. The linear park, in turn, has the potential to increase adjacent property values and the quality of life on both sides of the border while providing an important green corridor through the city. And here are some of our more fun proposals for the border wall. So we have a skate board park wall, a seesaw wall, a xylophone wall, a climbing wall, a swing wall, and a maze wall. So all ways um, to play on the wall. <clears throat> so I'd like to make an overview of the benefits of considering the border wall as having productive potential. In all, our re-envisioning of the border wall as infrastructure has beneficial consequences in at least three important arenas. First is the quality of life. Border towns lack the infrastructure that allows them to be sustainable, healthy cities, and infrastructural wall elements have the potential to provide city amenities amid urban growth. The second is security. Infrastructural elements are highly secure facilities and profits from infrastructure development projects and infrastructural improvements to border cities would go a long way towards contributing to an increased national security. And the last is jobs. So the construction of large scale infrastructural projects creates jobs, as do the manufacturing of vital components <clears throat> along the border. So prior to our border wall research for the WPA competition. Um, we have been working and researching and living on the border in a town called Prada Marfa <coughs> for a number of years. Uh, we were there and one of the projects that we completed was the design and building of a Prada store in the desert. So the store itself is a vision of the artist Elm Green and Drag Set 
And it's a sculptural piece that is commentary on the contrast between this high-end, urbane fashion institution and the kind of bereft, lonely, uh, impoverished, dusty conditions of the desert. So it's the contrast between wealthy and poor. <clears throat> uh, Elm Green and Dragset initially intended the Prada to be built in Nevada, so it would be Prada Nevada. But they couldn't find a benefactor to build it there, but kindly the ballroom Marfa stepped in and offered to pay for the construction, so it became Prada Marfa, which I think was to its advantage because the discussion turned into one that related to the border ecology. The primary building material used to construct this Prada store in the desert is dirt. A large percentage of buildings in the region surrounding Prada Marfa are also traditionally constructed of mud bricks. And while earthen architecture is traditionally considered a material of the poor, not too far away in Santa Fe, New Mexico, it's a building material of the very wealthy. In fact, Ronald Reagan's house in California was built out of mud bricks. So unlike traditional mud brick buildings in the area whose bricks are laid in an earthen mortar, these bricks are laid in a cement mortar, which is a nod to Donald Judd and the walls that he built around his compound in Marfa. <clears throat> it also looks at the juxtaposition between industrial and non-industrial materials. <clears throat> and the combination represents the bipolar nature of the context in which it is built. Because you have a large community of um, Mexican families and ranchers who are poor, but then you have an influx of artists coming in from all over the world uh, to see the work of Donald Judd. <clears throat> so the interior details remain true to the Prada brand. Lights are housed in coves underneath each shelf to illuminate the shoes, which give the building a nighttime presence and could even be considered a beacon. So it's possible that someone attempting to cross the border illegally might see the store in the desert and go there in search of health or in search of water. But what they'll find instead are the 2005 collection of Prada shoes. <clears throat> that said, it's not uncommon for immigrants who are making the tough journey across the desert to have their shoes wear out. <clears throat> and oftentimes, in a desperate attempt to protect their feet, they fashion shoes out of the yucca plants that dot the landscape. And a new exhibition is uh, emerging around the building. People who come and visit the Prada Marfa um, installation are starting to leave their shoes there as well. So it's getting a new life that we didn't uh, imagine would happen. So the next project that I'd like to talk about is the Hydro Wall. Uh, you saw a brief glimpse of this as one of the beacons in the um, border wall as infrastructure proposal. <clears throat> and this uh, is a building component design that takes advantage of CAD CAM technology. Um, the Hydro Wall <clears throat> is a panel that collects rainwater from roofs, stores water in the cavity of the walls, and the wall then acts as a thermal mass to help keep building interiors cool during the day, and warm at night, in environments that have large temperature swings like those along the border. So this is a working prototype that we fabricated, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, so how it works, oh, I don't think I can reach up there, but the, the intention is that water would run off from the roof and into the hydro wall. And as the wall begins to fill, it absorbs the temperature outside and stores it um, within the water itself. And water is the best thermal mass that there is. So it's better than concrete and better than earth. Um, <clears throat> when the wall is completely full, water is allowed to overflow onto the front surface. It's collected in cisterns along the front facade, which can also serve as planters. Uh, water can run down the front of the hydro wall. <clears throat> and the curves help direct the water away from the foundations. And water can also be siphoned out of the hydro wall and used as gray water or to supplement heating and cooling systems or for irrigation. <clears throat> in 
In thinking about the effectiveness of the wall, we did a number of case studies. And this one was for a fire station in Reno, Nevada. And it rains about three and a half inches in July in Reno, and I think about a little over a half inch in December. And we found that the south side of the building um, could collect that half inch of wall and fill it up uh, over the course of the month. And that would be enough water to help keep the temperature of the building at 70 degrees pretty consistently throughout the month, even when it goes down to 35 degrees at night. So it would be an effective way to mediate the interior climate. And in the summer, when there's more rainwater, the water could be siphoned out of the walls and used in the fire trucks, for example, or for irrigation. <clears throat> the hydro wall would be perfect for big box retail outlets that have large roofs and lots of rainwater runoff. In this example, the water collected could be used as gray water, used in the building's HVA system. The, the wall will prevent rainwater runoff from eroding the surrounding land and will contribute to the heating and cooling of the building during the day and the night because it's open 24 hours a day, right? <laughs> this would lead to the retailer saving money, which presumably would be passed on to you, the consumer. <clears throat> so we envision the wall being composed of a series of panels that are brought to the site um, empty, so they're very lightweight. They're tilted up into place and uh, silicone together, and there would be a um, cap at the top which would prevent the rainwater runoff from the roof from falling in between the panels to create the large system. And as the panels filled up with water, they would become heavy. <coughs> so for the working prototype that we built, we used uh, direct <coughs> manufacturing we used a three-axis CNC mill to mill the foam into a formwork, and it had to be milled in four pieces that would go together to create the formwork because of the undercuts of the gutter and the cistern on the front. And over that, uh, fiberglass was laid, <clears throat> and then automobile paint was coated on top of the fiberglass, and then the holes were drilled after that. So we had a boat builder make this for us. <clears throat> that said, ideally, we'd like to see these panels made not out of fiberglass, because it's not recyclable at the moment. But a much more economic and efficient way of making it would be to use a technique called roto-molding. <clears throat> so roto-molding involves using recycled plastic beads, which are heated up in a metal mold and melted. And the mold spins around, and the interior is coated with plastic to make a hollow object. And the plastic object can ultimately be melted down and recycled again. So the hydro wall would take advantage not only of recycling water from the building, but of recycled plastic and would be itself fully recyclable. So this is a technology that's not typically or traditionally used for building components, but rather <coughs> for um, product design, not construction, but production. Um, so kayaks are made this way, refrigerator panels, um, large uh, trash cans, for example. So a number of people were interested in the hydro wall, not for commercial purposes, but for residential purposes. And we decided, rather than applying the hydro wall panels to a traditional building footprint, we would instead design a hydro house. And so this is our proposal for a house, which kind of holistically looks at this idea of harvesting and storing water and using it as a thermal mass. And essentially, in the plan, you'll see there's a cooling pond over which the desert breezes would blow as they move into the interior living spaces. And at the very end is a chimney that helps draw that air out so it moves through the house. Um, <clears throat> the water holds, uh, I'm sorry, the roof holds the water uh, as well. Um, 
The walls are allowed to store the water just like the hydro wall panel does. But we've also added ripples on the side of the wall to store water on the exterior or to allow plants to grow on the exterior. And in this section, you can see kind of the sheer proposed mass of the earth, uh, I'm sorry, of the water wall. <coughs> and we also envisioned the interior elements, such as the bathtubs and the sinks, being incorporated into the design of this doubly curved surface, which is the water wall. Another building component that we've been working on uh, is called the planter bricks. The planter brick wall is designed to be a combination of traditional masonry combined with units that can hold plants and vegetation. The plants match the bricks, require little, if any, soil, but they do need water and nutrients. So the planter bricks have the potential to counter the heat island effect in big cities through evapotranspiration and pollution conversion and by the light reflective color of the bricks. Additionally, edible plants such as rosemary and other fragrant herbs with shallow root systems may be planted in the bricks and access through openings in the wall. The plants in the bricks will help mediate the temperature of the microclimate surrounding the building help buffer sound and filter air. The plants that are held in the bricks will be fed water and nutrients through drip irrigation lines that are built into the cavity of the masonry wall. And the indentations in the bricks that allow for irrigation act much like wheat poles, allowing water and nutrients to move through a network of continuous drip tubes. The water for the irrigation may be pumped up from below or could be harvested from cisterns on the roof of a building. Our planter bricks are made by direct digital manufacturing and rapid prototyping technology. Ceramic particles are printed and held together using an organic binder and then fired in a kiln just like traditional bricks. The bricks may be assembled in a load-bearing cavity wall condition or installed as a traditional masonry curtain wall <coughs> on a steel or concrete frame building. So we've modeled the bricks in a 3D software application and sent the digital file directly to our 3D printer for manufacture. So this means a very diverse um, and uniquely uh, infinite selection can be printed and manufactured for the architect or the owner of the building who wants to have um, the planter bricks. So the oldest bricks date back to around 7500 BC. And these were sun-dried mud bricks. And around, I think, the third millennium, we started to fire bricks. And with the Industrial Revolution and the steam engine, we started making brick machines, which used stiff mud, which was forced out in long ribbons and then cut with a wire, which is the way we still make bricks today. But with the invention of CAD CAM technology, as we march into the 21st century, we can liberate ourselves from these traditional ways of making bricks and the traditional forms without sacrificing any of the functionality. And finally, and most recently, we participated in an exhibition for the 2010 Biennial of the Americas in Denver, Colorado, the theme of which was the nature of things. And we were asked to make an interpretation of the world around us and to think about its construction. So we created an installation called Earth Scrapers, which is an installation that imagines the potential of employing computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing processes in the construction of a proto-architectural landscape one where the building material source and the building itself are seamless. It also demonstrates our own internal research, our own design and experimentation as we have hacked the C-Corp uh, 3D printer. And we started by experimenting with printing porcelains. So what you see here is a tiny, oh, it's about this big, 
porcelain uh, filigree surface that we printed and fired at cone five to harden it. Uh, this is a ball clay that we printed. And we printed several other materials as well as we started to think about what we wanted to include in the exhibit. So we printed with blood, we printed with bones, we printed with ashes. Um, but ultimately we decided to print the exhibit out of concrete um, for several reasons. One, it was very strong, it was very stable, it was very economical, <clears throat> and it had the effect of looking like earth because of the large amount of aggregate in our mix. So we experimented with linear and vertical modularity using rapid manufactured concrete. We made this tower, which as you can see is considerably larger than the 3D print bed. And so in the design process, we had to think about how the different pieces would attach together. So when you use the 3D printer, of course, you're not limited to that 8 by 8 by 10 inch bed. You can create much larger <coughs> assemblies. We also just used it, the exhibition, as an opportunity to play. And we wanted to experiment with different ideas. We wanted to experiment with different forms. We wanted to experiment with different software applications. So I think this photograph represents something uh, modeled in Rhino, something modeled in Modo, something modeled in TopMod, something modeled in Blender. So we kind of appropriated everything we could find and decided we would make a model out of it. <clears throat> we also wanted to expand on our interest in designing building components and we fabricated a concrete masonry unit wall in which every brick is unique. We can start to realize actual building components by 3D printing them and making load-bearing walls. So we were interested in making forms and objects and geometries that would, would be very difficult to make any other way. So this takes four or five hours to print, and then it needs to sit in the printer for another 24 hours before you can excavate it. And I can't imagine being able to make it any other way quite that fast. We were also interested in the spaces that we were creating, so we put the people in them and took close-up photographs. We were interested in these as landscapes since they were constructed out of the material which was intended to be the ground as well. We were interested in the surface texture. So what if this were full scale? What would that wall really be like? What would it feel like? What would it look like? <clears throat> this is our, one of our 3D printers and you can see uh, John here excavating one of the models and in the background some of the earlier studies of 3D printing porcelain and ball clays. And this is one of our failures. We originally wanted to make a really tall tower with a very thin filigree like skin but um, the pieces could never survive the weight of the build bed itself so it broke every time we tried to excavate it. And here we are cleaning off one of the models. This was an incredibly dirty process. <laughs> and this is our lab where we built the exhibit. Um, we decided to display all of the 3D, con 3D printed concrete objects on a topography, on a kind of dunescape or landscape that we modeled in Rhino, and then subdivided and um, constructed these boxes out of acrylic into which we poured the concrete. So the objects sit in a landscape of the same material out of which they're 3D printed. <clears throat> and here we attempted to not only put them on the landscape, but actually in the landscape as well, so that as people moved around the exhibit, um, they would discover new ways of seeing into the models. So imagine you're building a house and this large gantry comes out to the site 
and uses the material that's on the site to actually 3D print your house. So this is kind of a fantasy, but maybe a reality that's not so far away, right? We have 3D printers now that can print the scale of furniture, so chairs, chaise lounges. I think the largest 3D printer in the world right now can print 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet, so about the size of a room. It's in Italy, and they're printing um, pulverized sandstone, which has the same structural integrity as stone itself. So this is a future that I hope is realized in my lifetime. <laughs> we thought of desertification, erosion, mining, and dredging as a few of the many examples of natural and anthropogenic processes for shaping the landscape and have become the theoretical and material sources, sites, and context for the forms and spaces that we created in our 3D printed proposal. So, thank you. So, I don't know if there are any questions. Oh, sure. Which one is it? One? We go up and down. <laughs> so sometimes we're three or four people. And then, for example, for the WPA proposal, that happened quite uh, quickly. And there was a lot of research involved with that. And we went up to about seven or eight people for that. So we're small. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we have our 3D printers in the basement at Berkeley. <laughs> And we have a big, a big studio where we do the clean work. So we have kind of a dirty space and a clean space. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. One thing that's uh, kind of played past efforts to do something similar has been um, convection in the water. Um, when you have that temperature differential between one side of the wall and the other, it's hot on the outside, cold on the inside, whatever. Maybe water starts to circulate and you get the, it becomes a conductor instead of a heat storage. I was wondering if you guys um, had come up with anything interesting uh, in your designs that um, kind of addresses that issue? Well, I think the thickness of the wall would have to be calibrated, you know, depending on the size of the interior and the temperature swing of the exterior. And that could help address that issue. Um, you know, right now the water can be siphoned out. Um, potentially, it could be circulated as well. I feel like we need to get to a point with this project where we can actually really empirically test this at full scale to make some of those discoveries and then try to address the problems that arise. Yeah. I think there was a question over here. Yeah, so, so manufacturers working with you to try to bring this hydro wall. Market the hydro wall is a tough one, and I've spent a lot of time talking to people who do make tanks and to um, venture capitalists who are interested in water. And one problem is that water is really cheap. It's heavily subsidized by the government. And so a large capital investment in this project right now is difficult for a manufacturer to grasp with because they don't see the return right away. So I think it's inevitable at some point down the road, but um, right now water's cheap. So, yeah. Water wall is a really interesting idea. Um, sort of during the prototypes, you had experienced some conversation concerning how you came to be addressing that. Again, I mean, we made that one piece, and it, it functions itself alone, but again, it hasn't been um, installed you know, in a living environment, which I consider a building is living and for a long period of time. So I still think that would be an issue that we would have to address. I mean, certainly things like the color of the wall would help. Um, the fact that there are very few pores in the wall would help with condensation. 
uh, as well. One last question. You spoke in the bat your use of a number of, of, of CAD type systems, uh, softwares that you're using. I think you rattle off three or four or five of them. Um, have have you have you had ex much experience with, with compatibility issues and trying to use all these different uh, systems to try to do this modeling? You know, every year it gets easier. I, yeah, I remember uh, starting um, a, a long time ago now, 1995, <laughs> with my first uh, software, 3D modeling software program, FormZ, right, which I've kind of abandoned. But um, uh, every year it gets better. So moving from one to the other is, is very easy. And even moving from software um, that's good for modeling and rendering into other software such as Rhino, which is good for fabrication, is getting pretty easy too. So it's sometimes a minor obstacle, but it doesn't stop us. Yeah. yeah. A favorite? A favorite? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Modo. M O D O. Go to luxology.com. <laughs> yeah. No, you can't go inside. It's hermetically sealed, um, except to moths, <laughs> which is what I mean when I say buildings are living. You know, you, they built this thinking, oh, it's a piece of sculpture. It's in the desert. We're just going to let whatever happens, happens. But of course, immediately, the lights come on. Everyone leaves. The sun sets. And a million moths fly into the building. And the artist says, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> you know, so we have to figure out how to keep the moths out. Uh, and the snakes and all the things that can get really flat and go under the door. Right. Yeah. It seems like it might almost be a slap in the face for them to be wearing through shoes and come upon this place which is hermetically sealed, waste and electricity with a bunch of expensive wooden shoes in it. From people who are crossing the border illegally, I'm, I'm sure they're much greater concerns on their mind, right? And, and I'm not there talking to people as they come across the border, so I don't know. Um, it's, you know, it's meant, it caters to the artist community who comes to, to Marfa from New York and Los Angeles. It's something for them to see when they're coming to see Donald Judd's work. And I think for them, it does raise their awareness of certain issues um, if they look a little bit more deeply into it, which not everybody does, right? So if they want to know what it's made out of. And for example, we intentionally had the contractor leave the metal lath off so that as the stucco uh, comes off, you would see that it was made out of mud. Um, and that would happen sooner rather than later. Well, that was their original plan. Whatever happens will happen. But they haven't been able to, to live with that. So they maintain it. And there's a, a budget to maintain it, to keep it painted, to keep the lights on. The lights are solar powered. Um, to keep it clean, to clean the glass, yeah. And there's security cameras out there now and all. So, yeah. It took one day, yeah. <laughs> before someone broke in and stole all the shoes, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Hypnotic in a way, like they're kind of these imaginary places a little bit, or out in the desert. And I'm curious about like, the implications of this type of technology in a more urban condition. So there's these great ideas, but like maybe we should be building these things in more dense locations. And so how, if we're using the material that they're sitting on to build them, I, I understand your proposal correctly, then how does that, maybe how does that technology become useful in, in more 
for the environment. For, for which project? Um, well, I'm curious about this one that's on the screen now when you're talking about printing, printing these actual structures. Well, I think in this case, there's kind of a dual nature to the project, and that's that these 3D printed objects look like earth because of the aggregate in the cement. And so we wanted to make a connection to earth as a building material and the way that the landscape is constructed by man-made processes like erosion, which is a product of us right? living on and building in the landscape, and how that could actually start to become built up and become architectural. And so that's why you see these in the deserts and in the sand dunes. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, that's yes, this, this kind of vision, right? But on the other hand, with the, um, the concrete masonry units, so I'll just go back quickly. Here we potentially have <coughs> a way of using this technology to print a brick. Right? So you're all familiar with a concrete masonry unit, right? So why not use this technology to rethink that CMU, to rethink the shape of it, the form of it, the way it performs? Um, because we're 3D printing each piece and someone's not making them all out of the same mold or the same dye, uh, they can all be different. And how does that change the form of the building? And how would that change it in an urban context, for example? what would the form of the building have to be to respond to its surroundings? And how could this um, method of producing the building components help you realize that as a designer, I guess? intensity of construction, just how long it takes right. to construct buildings of size and, and, and how, uh, 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 because of that labor intensity, how much it costs to do it. It seems to me these explorations, um, and all the solutions, by the way, they come up with, they're pretty clunky over the years of uh, you know, precast concrete structures and, and, and so forth. These explorations seem to me to be suggestive of and this 3D printing process, technology seems to be suggesting ways of going back and revisiting that uh, issue of labor intensivity to create curtain walls that could actually be fabricated and put together pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I would like to think that that's a potential future of this application for sure. Sure. I think she raised her hand first. Where did you get the inspiration and what, what makes you decide for all these forms? Is it from existing ecological forms or from status state infographic or existing urban fabric that you decide to make this mix? Um, kind of the carbolinear nature of some of the projects. Is that what you're referring to? Um, <clears throat> well, a lot of it is a product of of just playing with the software. So for example, I mentioned Modo, which is a surface modeler. Um, it's polygonal. It's about subdividing. It's like sculpting. So you can grab a polygon with your cursor, and you can just pull it. And you immediately have a deformed surface. So a lot of the things that we're making are products of the tools that we're using. So, <clears throat> And I think that's, that's fine, right? If I were using a parallel bar, I would be making a very different form, right? I would be making the Barcelona Pavilion, <laughs> right? So it's partially a product of, of the, um, the tools that we're using. And then I think also I'm interested in very old buildings and very old building technologies. I'm interested in the earthen architecture of Africa, which is very sinuous and very curvaceous and is also made of dirt. And so I think I'm inspired by those forms as well. So inspiration can come from a lot of different places. Yes. This is really on kind of the CAD CAM rapid prototyping, kind of building a prototype, testing it. Um, I'm just curious if 
you've incorporated any kind of simulation software as well to, in, with the 3D uh, modeling software to kind of test things in a computer before doing some of the rest of the Only solar conditions. So we haven't moved beyond that. But it's a good, it's a good next step. Yeah. And I acknowledge that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.